Hello, my name is George Littlejohn from the CISI. Catherine Flood, who joins us today, is one of the stars in the already stellar Bailey Gifford. She joined the firm in January 2007 and is now a Corporate Strategy Director for Scottish Mortgage Investment, PLC. Before this, Catherine specialised in the firm's international growth and diversified growth strategies, servicing institutional clients in both North America and the UK. Now, you don't need me to tell you what a success story Bailey Gifford has been overall, or about the consistent and solid returns that Scottish Mortgage has delivered to investors cycle in, cycle out, since it was formed in 1909, 111 years ago. Catherine's a Cambridge Law graduate, and as you'll hear, she spent some time working in China before being called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2003, before moving to Edinburgh with Bailey Gifford. And now, to get the ball rolling, here's Catherine. George, thank you. Yes, I thought I would just make some comments around one of the key things that we're thinking about for Scottish Mortgage at this moment, some of the, the longer term shifts that we're starting to come through and then open it up to questions. I'm really keen that the audience actually get to hear what they want to know about rather than I just drone on for half an hour at them, um, with a slide now. So I thought I would start by putting into context, you know, Scottish Mortgage is looking for extraordinary companies that have the potential over the next five to 10 years and beyond, not to do a little bit better than the market, but the, the really standout businesses that change the way we all live. So if you go back over the last few decades, names that might come to mind are, you know, Microsoft and the change to home computing that they brought in. And and then most people will be very familiar with we're using one of the companies, but the shift to digital alongside the internet. So we were all uh, a long time ago used to modems that crunched along as we, we went through. But actually what's happening now is that the technology that the internet brought with it is now impacting a much wider range of industries. And, and this is really, really significant. So over the last decade, if you'd have just picked the large internet platforms and invested in those alone, you'd have done pretty well. So I'm, I'm talking about Amazon, Facebook, Google, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu. And to be honest, in investment terms, it really wasn't that much broader. They were the dominant platforms that went out. They were the better business models. And that scale driven by the microeconomics that software offers where you get increasing returns to scale. So you don't get mean reversion, you don't get the, the problem of diseconomies of scale, really has created some very large businesses who've been able to expand the areas that they're addressing. What I think we're now seeing is that that has been changing in the last 12 to 18 months. You know, you've seen the rise of the next generation. And this is a generation of companies not like Snap or Twitter that have tried to take on the giants at their own game. They're a new generation of entrepreneurs who are taking the tools these big digital platforms offer and then building a business on top of it that finds its own white space. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about the experience of shopping on Amazon, it's phenomenally practical. You can get huge amounts of stuff on it if you know what you want. It's less good at, for example, the more merchandised experience of shopping. So clothing retail in particular has struggled beyond the kind of the basics. And in Europe, we invest in a company called Zalando, which is actually now the Europe's biggest online clothing retailer, purely online. Everything they do is from start to finish set up for that rather than an old fashioned bricks and mortar store that has an online presence. In the US, we own a furniture company. I don't know about you, but the experience of going to a massive warehouse, looking at a sofa and trying to work out what size it is when you get back to your living room is quite challenging. There should be digital tools we can use for these businesses. But key to actually making the economics work is not just about capturing people's imagination for your products in the first place or the marketing. It's making sure that their experience of having that furniture delivered is as smooth as possible so that next time they just come straight back to you. And so a business in the US called Wayfair is one that we've invested in. The market hated it because it was investing very heavily in that back office, that delivery functionality. So it depressed short term profits, but actually it's been key to keeping its business growing. And although the overall industry has, has really been challenged in previous months in, in the current climate, what's happened is people have gone to Wayfair instead. So it's been saying it's, although it's a shrinking sector, it's the one that's taking the business. And we think that's quite common because it's just offering a better experience for consumers. Beyond that, we're seeing companies that are addressing a different client base. What do I mean by that? Well, Shopify 
is actually a company out of Ottawa in Canada, not the first place you go looking. But what it does is try to service merchants rather than the end consumers. End consumers are covered by Amazon. So what it does is offer all the functionality for small and medium sized enterprises to run an online business and all of the support systems in terms of running their business that go behind that to give them the benefits of scale that you wouldn't normally get as a small and medium sized enterprise. And it's been growing really strongly. It's got a very interesting founder owner. And that's typical of what we're looking for. We really want owners of these businesses who don't care about the short run. They're there to build a business for the next decade or beyond. But we think there are some really interesting ones coming up. The next system that I think is really changing is financial services and particularly the plumbing that sits behind that. So payment systems. It doesn't sound glamorous, but it's a very vital node in the network that makes these digital businesses work across whole range of areas. So it's companies like Stripe, invented by two brothers from Ireland, a firm, it's a company that does point of sale payment, is much more transparent than credit card, it's challenging the dominance of Visa and MasterCard, and it's been created by Max Levshin, who you'll probably remember was one of the original PayPal mafia. So again, we, we like this combination of committed founders, but we also have experience building very large businesses that should be able to take effectively a economic return from a point in a very strongly growing network. So for example, Stripe can be seen as a, as a royalty rate on entrepreneurship in the, on the internet. It doesn't matter which entrepreneur on the internet wins, they're gonna need a payment system. And today, you don't design that for your own business, you put a few lines of code in from Stripe and that makes it work. So we really like that dynamic. We've got a company in Latin America called Mercado Libre. It's effectively an online retailer, but there's a really interesting payment system Pargo that goes along with that, which is why we've invested. So we really think these changes are coming. Interestingly, that's taken more time here in the West than it has in China. And I think that's a combination, you know, we were, we were talking about China. The growth of China in the last two to three decades has been absolutely extraordinary. But I think the thing that's hard to understand is that when we see it through our lens, we have an existing, very well set up system that the internet had to challenge. But in China, there really wasn't that much formalization of retail. So you've got these dominant platforms like Alibaba, but their scope was much broader. So they've got the, the services to the, the merchants as well as to the end consumers, the, the two platforms. But you also got an opportunity to broaden that out. So they have a, a web services business that like Amazon provides cloud computing, but it does more than that because there isn't that formalization of all the systems like SAP that we have. So it's offering those services on top of it. So it's got an even broader opportunity set. But against that, China is a good illustration of where you have a very healthy competitive market, there's a next generation snapping your heels. So once upon a time, our largest holding was Baidu. We've now sold it. It is the search engine that dominates in China. They remain the dominant search engine. What they haven't managed to do is monetize it by moving into new areas. So you've seen the likes of Meituan Dianping, which offers offline to online services. Think food delivery. It's probably their biggest area. And they, for context, deliver something in the region of 30 million meals a day. The US competitor Grubhub is something like half a million for context. There's just a lot more people in very dense cities in China. It gives a much bigger opportunity set for them. But this is very much the start of their ambition. They want to get to 100 million by 2025. They're also looking at autonomous delivery vehicles. The current environment, they can minimize person-to-person -person contact for delivery. But they're expanding much further beyond that. They're taking takeaway and adding grocery to it. So we think these are big businesses who are the ones that have come through a very tough environment and have managed to grow in the presence of the big platforms that we've owned for a long time, Alibaba, Tencent. And I would also add into one to that, which is Pinduoduo, which a bit more like Zalando, it's, it's taken it even a step further. It's answering the need whereby shopping is an, a form of entertainment. Shopping on the big platforms may be fine, but in the West, we haven't really managed to replicate it as a experience in its own right. You have Singles Day for Alibaba, this huge, big, dropping extravaganza show that people watch in China, extraordinary numbers. Pinduoduo is more about making the everyday shopping experience more gamified to get people engaged with using the platform, spending more time on the platform. So it's really interesting business models that we think can grow very much the next generation that have come through a tough competitive environment.
But I think that's to stay within the prefecture that we've, we're pretty comfortable with, media and retail. What's happening now with the digitalization of the economy is that it's moving out be much further beyond that. So you're seeing the impact of data and healthcare come together through the power of genomics. So in the current environment with the pandemic, where we've all been struggling and everybody wants a, a solution to the virus, that's very understandable. What's become really clear is that whatever that solution tends to be, it will be based on genomic testing. If you look how fast we managed to sequence this virus compared with SARS or compared with Ebola, you can see the progress in, in genomics. And so this is an area where we've been investing for quite some time. It is quite challenging. We can come on with this interest from the audience talking about the challenges of investing in therapeutic businesses and understanding how they might work as platforms. But for us, the clearest ones that where you can start to bring in a skill set where you're out analyzing the competitive advantages of the businesses you own are in those where you get an intersection of data and healthcare. So I mean Grail, which was spun out from Illumina. It's a genetic testing company. And Grail's simple aim is to provide a, a pan cancer test that is as simple as going to your doctors and getting a blood test. Now you can see the huge potential of this. The science is very well understood. It is the same science that sits behind the replacement to amniocentesis tests for pregnant women testing for a range of conditions, including Down syndrome. So it's not so much that we're taking a view on the science, it's about the business model that sits on top of that science. You know, how valuable might a pan-cancer test be if you can detect it at stages one and two when it's much more treatable, but may not be symptomatic. So that's how we've been thinking about it. And then synthetic biology is sort of the next step of what genetics has done for us. So our, our ability to sequence nature has led to a much broader understanding of biology. And we are starting to see businesses use our understanding of biology to synthesize industrial scale processes for what nature provides. So we own a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. And what they own is basically the roadmap of how you produce these compounds through a synthetic biological process that probably doesn't mean very much to make it a bit clearer rose oil at the highest end rose oil is made by growing roses in a field it's as temperamental as it sounds weather dependent big fields in turkey and it goes into your very high-end perfumes and the best rose oil demands an extremely high price but about 95 percent of the things from your foodstuffs to your household cleaners, to your basic purpose, all of that is actually hydrocarbons. And so there's a huge market there where if it was a more natural process, you could take more in a value chain. And that's exactly what Ginkgo is looking to do in that and many other processes. And then lastly, because I'm sure there'll be questions on that and I want to make sure we've got plenty of time, there is a real structural change. Probably the biggest of all is that shift in energy generation that we've been talking about for some time. If there's interest, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to that. And obviously, Tesla is our largest holding there. But I just wanted to pause and, and see where you wanted to take the conversation. I guess what you're doing is grabbing companies which in the past would have gone to the listing relatively early compared with now that an awful lot of excellent businesses are not going through the, what would have been the traditional route of having a listing after a few years of startup, scale up and so on. A bit like over your shoulder there in Edinburgh is Bank of Scotland's headquarters and just behind them is Skyscanner. Huge, great yes. example, Scotland's first unicorn, which traditionally, I guess, 20 years ago would have been a startup, a scale up. It's a travel booking service, which works very well. I use it or I used to use it a lot when traveling was allowed, um, but then was sold um, without any listing process to a Japanese investor a couple of years ago for 1.4 billion. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So we, we own Skyscanner as a um, private company. As you say, homegrown, delighted, all sorts of characteristics that are what we look for. And in the 12 months we owned it, we made a 40% return. And I think what surprises people is that we were really disappointed to see that sale. Um, you know, actually, we own the acquiring business, we own Sea Trip. There's no doubt that Chinese consumers are wanting to travel more. C-Trip is really well placed to do that. It made sense to tie up. It gave C-Trip international exposure. From C-Trip's point of view, you could see it. But from our point of view as investors, what we're trying to do is really benefit from the long-term compounding of investment returns, though it doesn't come in a straight line, from these businesses that really can keep scaling and doubling and doubling and doubling again. Eventually, their share prices will follow it not a straight line but if you get a period where companies are being sold you're capping the upside 
you've taken all the risk to the capital you've invested, but you're not really benefiting from the key advantage of investing in equities. And all we're trying to do for Scottish Mortgage is not be a one-stop shop, but just capture that because most people find it incredibly hard because of the inevitable volatility in share prices in markets that get moved by all sorts of factors. And so for us, Skyscanner is illustrative of a different problem that we have. We were very often asked, why don't we have more invested in UK equities? And it's really, it's not that we haven't found that great businesses can be started in the UK. Illumina, which is the dominant gene sequencing giant across the world, literally started in a pub in Cambridge. But it took an acquisition of an American company to really realize its commercial potential. The difficulty is scaling those businesses from the level of Skyscanner on. You know, the, the poster child for this would be we wanted Arm to remain an individual company because it had the potential to do in the internet age, the, the mobile technology age, given what it does, and I should probably mention what it does, it essentially is like the architect of the chip design for your silicon chips that go into all of the devices that now have them from your phone, your laptop, all through to your washing machine, your cars. You know. So it was, it was in a really great place to have the same sort of potential to extract a royalty you know, in the same way that Intel had in a different age. And we sold it as a UK investment base to SoftBank for a premium that when you took a longer term view was, was not as high as it optically looked. And, and that is a real challenge for investors trying to do what we're, we're doing. And so that is something that we, we try to look for. It's just these few businesses that have the power, but also the willingness, the founder owners who are not going to sell out, who are not going to cap our upside. You've got this extraordinary record as a firm for finding companies that people have never heard of. I mean, for instance, I'd never heard of Ant International before Bailey Gifford announced a stake in it. And it is just a vast, vast firm back to our friend China. That works extraordinarily well. It's considerably bigger than most of the payment systems in the world. And yet people haven't heard of it until you invested in it. Yeah. And so for those who don't know, Ant Financial is the financial services arm that was grown out of Alibaba. So there's often a narrative that comes around saying when Yahoo sold its stake, and actually we were one of the buyers of that stake in 2012 when Alibaba was a private company, there's some sort of notion that Alibaba had a choice in this. It had to separate out these assets. And what it did was take its main platform and then build out from the information it had on its customers different services that it was better able to provide. So it offers payment services. And along with those payment services, it allowed you to keep cash on the platform. And as a side business, it ended up with the world's largest money market fund from just the spare cash because the Chinese government told them they had to pay an interest rate on it. And from there, it's gone to five different areas, which include credit store and they include microfinancing to the businesses that sit on Alibaba's platform and otherwise but it's doing it with an ability to use real data. And what do I mean by that? Like if it's insurance business, it doesn't have to use the kind of statistical assumptions that other players do. It has the data on the individuals who they're lending to. You know, if you're a business that sits on Alibaba's platform, it knows what your customer turnover looks like. It knows what your costs are. It can link all that information and therefore do a better job of this. And so this isn't about them kind of, taking over it's more about it's a better business model than the existing one and it's using the technology that we've seen through that mobile connectivity in a world where as we started by talking about doesn't have that formalized infrastructure so they've been able to leapfrog that and they're now much further ahead of us in terms of that digitalization thank you we've got questions coming in about digital healthcare, about the ipo pipeline and about uh, renewable energy can we turn to that first just last week a week ago mm. today actually we launched with 12 professional bodies, including the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, the Chartered Banker Institute based in Edinburgh, a green finance education charter. So renewable energy is very high up our common agendas right now. It was launched by John Glenn from the Treasury and Quasi Quarteng from Bayes. Hugely important issue, and we're very keen on that sector. The question here is, that is the renewable energy space in it? Which segment are you positive on? Wind, power, solar, others? Hydrogen, blue and green hydrogen is a great fascination of mine right now. And I'm not going to explain it, and I hope you can, although I can try to. But which sector is most exciting in renewable energy for Bailey Gifford? So I think this is a really interesting area where we, as I said, you know, the, the, the 
shift in energy generation is incredibly rare. There's really only been three <laughs> in the whole of history. Whereas sadly, the, the pandemics, which are focus of many people's minds, are, are, are more prevalent and more predictable, albeit still, thankfully, relatively rare events. But just to give a bit of context around that for, for some, you know, last year in May was the first time since 1833 that the UK had gone without using coal to produce electricity. And for those who are interested, that's since Thomas Edison's um, power plant in the Holborn Viaduct opened to power London street lighting. But since then, it had been continuous. Roll forward even 12 months, and this is really an accelerating process. So now we've seen it go several weeks without using coal for generation. And that has largely been the rise of renewable energy, particularly solar, where you've seen these huge improvements in efficiency following a pretty well understood curve. You know, this is not the first time we've seen these sort of accelerating curves in technology at uptake. And it's really through the application of capital. And we'll come back to why that's important in a minute. But you get a corresponding decline in the cost of the technology. We don't think as investors, we have a clear competitive advantage in saying this technology is better than that technology at an early stage. What we do is say, we look at these curves, we're just trying to observe it. But once we get that and we can see it coming, we know that it's pretty remorseless. We know that people underestimate this. They struggle, investors in particular, struggle to correctly price in linear growth in a straight line that persists. It's even worse when you get an acceleration where you get that J curve type growth and the corresponding decline in costs and the long term ramifications of it. But we think this has been a long term coming and I'm sure uh, listeners are familiar with the things that we've been saying for a number of years now on this. But this is really at the transition point. So I don't think we're taking a view in terms of what we're investing in, in in one technology or another, unless we can find a business that then offers us a clear competitive advantage, which means they're going to be the ones that earn an economic return that make us a sort of money. We're not, in this sense, an ESG fund here. We're talking about the E section of that. You know, we won't buy an investment just because it's a good company. We have to buy it because it's a good investment. Part of that is the old fashioned analyzing a company's competitive advantage. And the reality is for many investors, there's a challenge here that the only company we've managed to find that is that's publicly listed and large with that kind of dynamic so far as Tesla, which is part of the reason it's one of our biggest holdings. Conversely, we, we do think that this is not a question simply about which is the best technology. It is about which reaches the level of adoption that means that it becomes the dominant technology. So as I like to remind James, it is in fact not the first time that New York taxis have been dominated by electric vehicles. That happened in the late 1800s. And as Mrs. Ford said to Mr. Ford and Thomas Edison over dinner, you know, actually electric vehicles are a better technology than internal combustion engine. There just comes a point when it doesn't matter. The infrastructure reaches a critical mass in one technology where you can provide an economic return on the business models that that uses, where it becomes dominant for a, a, a substantial period. And that's where we think we are. As it happens, those that we speak to externally take the view that actually electric vehicles, battery technology does now exceed hydrogen, but it's not how we've come to the investment thesis. We are looking beyond Tesla at a number of companies in the battery technology space, but they're all private. And the key here is trying to understand which have the potential to offer the sort of returns that we're looking at. Because the, the temptation with some of the renewable companies is that they're great. It doesn't mean they're not a good investment. It means we're not looking for that for Scottish mortgage. And if you're not getting that clear competitive advantage, you're going to get more utility-like returns. Not a bad thing, just not what we're trying to do for Scottish mortgage. I'd love to dig in more to your investment process. There have been a couple of questions about this. I mean, just, just down the hill from the Skyscanner behind you is Codebase, which happens to be Britain's biggest tech incubator, possibly Europe's as well. And there there's yeah. a strong concept of looking at the, the space in which people find themselves. In other words, where in the stack of technology people find themselves. There's another question. Let's come back to that on digital healthcare. But how, what, how does the process work? How do you decide who's going to work and who isn't? So someone comes through the door and says, we're the new Facebook. The traditional reaction of anyone would be, thank you and goodbye. But there will be a new Facebook coming, as Tesla has been, as Skyscanner was to a certain extent. How do you decide who to have and who to say good luck to? So I, I think that's a really good question. And I think it comes down slightly to the difference of what we're doing 
and what this is code based in, we, we know and have a lot of respect for, but they're getting involved and, and they, um, along with others, were supporters of Skyscanner, as you say. I think the challenge is to understand where your skill set lies as investors. Our skill set is applying a genuinely patient approach to investing in companies based on their operational businesses but once they've reached that certain critical mass where you can start to bring in the skill set around analyzing you know could they develop a competitive advantage how much capital will it takes to do that how do they access that capital are they going to do it through their own sales so they become effectively less dependent on external sources what do their backers look like are their backers time horizons aligned with your own and where do they go what are the total addressable markets how are they thinking about expanding it and all of those things in the sort of area that the venture capital space is doing, it's far too early. You just need to get the company off the ground. And that requires a different skill set we don't have currently. And so for Scottish Mortgage, although we invest in private companies, you know, by the time we invested in Alibaba, as I mentioned in 2012, you know, this was 45 billion. You mentioned an ant. It's now over a $150 billion company. It's not two guys you know, in, a, in a room in, in this is code base. There is a real difference here and our skill set is better suited to that latter group where you can start to bring that analysis in where they still need patient shareholders i mentioned you know that you have to be prepared to invest in the near term to grow your business but also to really cement your competitive advantage so one of the things that's really noticeable that stands out in investing in amazon is they do very little investor relations when you go it's always the same people you see because they have found themselves a cohort of investors who are prepared to take that long-term view, who are very willing to let them see, if you're making profits in one area of the business, reinvest it heavily in the next one. You know, that's how they created AWS. It is, to our mind, exactly what's created all the value in Amazon, is that willingness not to think about earnings. But if you read their corporate reports, you'll see right from the beginning, there's an extraordinary focus on cash flows. And we agree, we think businesses live and die by their cash flows, not by their earnings numbers. Earnings are what you have left when you can't think of anything else to invest in. So look at the track record on the capital employed rather than worrying about the earnings number. I went to a fascinating lunch a couple of years ago with the um, former head of tech technology at Alibaba in China, who by then was head of Alipay in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was a lunch about fintech and he spoke for 20 minutes and it was fascinating, but he didn't mention fintech once. And I asked him, why didn't you mention fintech and he said we don't do fintech we do tech mm -hmm. and his point was raised actually by the first question which came in a little while ago early on from jeremy McEwen, which is that what's your view of digital healthcare this man whose name i'm not going to try to pronounce but let's go for say say roughly his view was that technology was so broad and could link so many things together that their mission as a firm was to pull as much as they could together digital healthcare hugely important it's gone a bit quiet in terms of news coverage during um, the virus crisis, because people are looking for a non-digital solution to the virus, i.e. a vaccine, but suddenly it's become of investment importance and relevance again. It's never gone away, it just went, went quiet for a while. So I suspect this is, this is linking into something else that we think is a tendency of our industry that's not helpful. I think we would agree 100% that the label of fintech is so broad, it tells you nothing about the industry, because it isn't truly one industry. It is the application of technology to an extremely broad base. And I think the digital healthcare is really interesting because I suspect that's exactly the same sort of dynamic that you're seeing. So we talked about Illumina and genomics. One of the things that's often missed is, yes, we have been able to sequence the human genome. But in order to really gather something meaningful, we have to do that many, many times. And I forget how many base pairs there are in a full human genome, but there's enough that the data set from that is vast. So if you're looking at doing pan population studies of 100,000 people or more to see these long run trends, you can't humanly curate that data set. It's too big. So unless we had the digital rise to the application of Moore's law combined with that progress it's driven in artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning, we would not have been able to extract the meaningful information from that vast data set in anything like an applicable time frame. So that digitalization is, is incredibly broad. Digital healthcare in the sense of delivery 
through digital platforms is slightly different. We do have investments in that area. We think it makes sense. There are two industries that have been extremely slow to embrace the digital age. One is healthcare and the other is education. We are starting to see that change through, you know, the medium of doctors being able to have at least an initial consultation on these sort of platforms. You know, we can answer the, the questions that need to be answered around security. That's a work in progress. But it must be better if you think somebody might be sick, not to take them to a place where you know there are people who are sick. There's also a efficiency point about not bringing people to surgeries, but being able to do it from a room in their house or a room in their office. You know, these platforms should offer exactly the same benefits in healthcare that we've seen elsewhere. And so we do think that that will rise. We also have a company called Tempus, which is looking at the digitalization of patient records, because a lot of them are genuinely still docket folders where you put the next piece of paper in them and they're held in vast record halls but they're not aggregated so each hospital in, in america each hospital system has their own record system that's not efficient if you can take that digitalize that you should be able to get patients to be able to use a digital app to manage their own health care it should improve compliance rates because you can send them messages as to what time they need to take what medication to input symptoms so you've got a better patient tracker you should then be able to anonymize and aggregate that data to do much bigger studies so there's huge potential here but these are some very different dynamics that don't give you one meaningful way when we have looked at healthcare we have been we have thought about the businesses on the basis of how big a portfolio position size they are so those i guess alumina is the, the easiest example because it's like buying the spades and shovels it doesn't matter which of the new generation of whether it's diagnostics or therapeutic businesses win, chances are they're all going to need to do genomic sequencing because that's what's driving us forward. There should be a bigger rise. Now, candidly, we have seen disappointing revenues from Illumina on this. We haven't seen quite the, the process that we would expect, partly because big pan population studies are not possible at the moment if you've got to bring people into hospitals to do that. But it is something that we're looking at with this company. But we don't think that there'll be any change. We think that the increasing levels of genomic testing is here to stay and actually is very beneficial. So then the next tier of companies is those ones that I mentioned, but they are much more binary often in their outcomes. So if you're a, a therapeutics business that is developing a new therapy that has the potential to treat not just one particular instance, but to go more broadly, that changes the dynamics from a one instance drug but it still leaves you with that dynamic whereby if it doesn't work out, if the clinical trials don't show that it's effective, your business is worth almost nothing. Right. So they're much smaller holdings in the portfolio. So it's not only about understanding what we've invested in, but it's also then saying, how do we think about the payoffs? And for every investment, whether it's healthcare or not, we're looking across a range of scenarios, saying how much money would we make in each of those scenarios um, on the basis of this business? How likely are those scenarios to come to pass? What's the risk that the capital will go to zero? And then balancing that risk return. And that, and that happens right across the portfolio. But I guess in, the, in the, the extreme is the healthcare treatment companies where you're looking at those in testing. And we own a number that have potential candidates for COVID, but there's no guarantee that they'll succeed. We wish them luck, of course. Indeed. We've got a big question in about relationships between China and the US, the risks of that. Let's come back to that in a moment. But some questions about... Uh, retail, we've had some rather disappointing news from the great high street store with John Lewis and Boots just this morning and about food delivery and ride sharing retail. How can Paul Ingramass, how can people like, he doesn't name them, but John Lewis and Boots compete with the likes of Amazon, whom you mentioned earlier? What is the position of people like that in the next years, let alone decade? It's a good question. And then there's a very human impact from the struggle that we're seeing businesses all businesses go through in the pandemic and i think while we've looked at every business that we own and we've tried to be supportive writing to them to say look do what you need to do to get through this period we're absolutely there we're not going to put we don't anyway but you know there's no pressure on course we would rather you were investing in the long term you know this is a tough environment for all businesses retail is one particular area but like anything else every industry has to respond to the challenges of new business models as they come along. I think context is important here. Amazon is large. It is the largest digital platform retailer 
in the US, but it's not the largest retailer in the US by any means. It's more like Costco, you know, Walmart is still a lot bigger. So it's about having every business, and this is Amazon included, you have to keep adapting as the environment around you changes, otherwise you become Kodak. And that's the kind of classic innovators dilemma. And, and that's what we think is a real challenge. I don't think it's perhaps the, the pandemic is accelerating change, but it was already happening. And it was because consumers were saying, you know, we want that greater choice. We want that, that freedom to use it. There are others in the portfolio who've done a really good job of digitalizing their business. If you look at what perhaps one of the ones that you wouldn't expect, but caring, if you look at what their brands are doing, at the highest end of luxury, they haven't just assumed that you're always going to want to walk into a shop in Paris and buy the goods. You know, they have really embraced the digital age. We own Inditex, phenomenal rise of Zara and its other brands. They were quite early on in saying, as the world digitalizes, we need an answer to this. Now we want to use our entrenched store base to actually enhance what we can offer online. Because if we're going to compete against the likes of, you know, Zalando, then they don't have an entrenched store base that people can take things back to and feel more comfortable that it's easy to return things. So you, it's about taking what you have as a business and then adapting as the world around you changes. And we can talk about the car manufacturers in that context, because I know that often comes up. But for retail, it, you know, we are going to need to see retailers like John Lewis adapt through their website and engage with customers in different ways. Stores are going to need to offer something more than they have in the past to, to keep their place. Thank you very much. Now, ride sharing and food delivery, how do you see the future for, for them? And I should tell you, there's a rather sweet note from uh, a lovely member of ours, Sarah Shah, who says that he's enjoying this so much that he wants to watch it again, perhaps more so than repeatedly. So Sarah, keep watching now, but do enjoy the, the, the re reviews on um, CISI TV. And thank you for being with us today. But food delivery and ride sharing, where are they headed? Yes. Thank you very much for the comments. So I think I'm going to do them in reverse order because I think the ride share probably dovetails in quite well with something we haven't yet touched on, which is transportation and the mass shifts that we're seeing there. But food delivery, I heard a different CEO actually um, from Shopify say we've had a decade's worth of shift towards these digital platforms happen in three months. I think that's quite extreme. It's not quite the same in every case, but the food delivery companies are really interesting and we own a number of them in the portfolio and others that we don't. I talked about Meituan, which is the, the largest by far, which is that the Chinese platform. But I think it applies more broadly. Delivery Hero operates in over 40 countries and it's a German-based company built out of Berlin, run by an extraordinary gentleman called Nicholas Osterberg, really thoughtful. And I think it's a good illustration of how disciplined you have to be in, in terms of investing your capital for growth. It is not just about constantly throwing money at the growth of your business. You have to be thoughtful about it. So in Berlin, Delivery Hero were locked in a two-way competition, more or less, with Takeaway.com. But as I said, Delivery Hero operates in 40 countries, most of which it's the, the sole player and is becoming dominant player, bringing on all restaurants. They have the discipline to sell their German business to takeaway.com to avoid that really damaging competition that drains returns where you're not getting enough return on the capital invested and there are better opportunities elsewhere. I can't think of many European country companies other than that who have been prepared to sell their domestic market business to be that disciplined about capital allocation. But it absolutely makes sense on a long-term both trajectory for that business and how they develop. And that's the sort of innovation that we want to see in the businesses we own. We also own a company called HelloFresh. It was a company created by Rocket Internet, another company that we hold. Incidentally, Rocket Internet also created Zalando. And here is really interesting because their biggest competitor was Blue Apron in the US. And I think most people are familiar with the delivery of food kits so that it's healthy food that you make yourself but it comes with a recipe, pre-portioned, it makes it very easy for you. And this is a business that requires scale. The share price got hammered because of the troubles of Blue Apron, but Blue Apron's failure to execute was exactly what opened the door to HelloFresh in the US market. And HelloFresh quietly got on with investing in that operational functionality that delivered customers' expectation of service. During lockdown, they've seen an extraordinary rise here in the UK, They've hired 50% more staff at a processing plant down in Oxford way, cope with that excess demand to make sure that customers get the sort of service they want to see. And, and many will not use it 
on an ongoing basis who've used it during lockdown, but enough will be that you'll see a step change in their growth rate. And for us, what we're trying to do is analyze that long-term impact and just look through the estimates on the, the near-term numbers for them. But we think it's really interesting. There is a clear demand for people to be able to quickly eat healthy food. And we think that's a really interesting company who are thinking about what else could we sell through the same? How could we, how could we increase the addressable markets? Seems very simple, but add a bottle of wine. It, it's such an additional, but it's a huge market that it opens up if you can do that through a cohort of people who already trust you and are prepared to transact on a financial basis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to see companies doing that and we think there's a real potential here. Now, James, as a historian, would remind me that it actually it's only reverting back to type, that the, the notion we all can't cook individually is one of the last uh, century or so and that actually longer term, there's always been an aggregate food supply delivery. Right, you could be right, indeed. Can we, before coming to this important US-China question, can we come back to Tesla? You've got a huge holding in Tesla, Fascinating business. Um, why don't car companies compete with Tesla more effectively? I've just bought a new car and it was quite hard to find something that was right for us because of various travels, but Tesla looked right. It couldn't quite get far enough for regular travels for Wales in our case. But why don't the traditional car companies compete with Tesla? And also you're invested in SpaceX. Can we come back to that separately? Because I'm intrigued by SpaceX. Tesla's really interesting in the sense that it began as a company that was not meant to produce cars. It was meant to produce powertrains for the existing internal combustion engine dominated industry on the premise that it was obvious that we all needed to go electric to solve some of the wider issues that it offered long-term potential. And it was only when it became clear that they, the, the traditional makers just could not accept something which was such a huge challenge that Mr. Musk then went on to say, right, well, I'll build the car company myself then. I think what's really interesting is if you look back in history, he has made powertrains for others, uh, including uh, Mercedes. It took him less time to design, create and deliver the prototype than it did for them to order the, the, to create the purchasing order. And that's because once you become a giant, you become wrapped in the diseconomies of scale. You become vested in your technology and you get that innovator's dilemma. Electric cars, the key skill set is around software. The internal combustion engine, everybody who's built their careers at these big manufacturers, are engineers in the sense of high temperature, high pressure, lots of moving parts. It's a completely different skill set. You cannot just retool the existing line very easily and turn around and go, tomorrow we're making electric cars. We've been, and I think it's fair to say, Tesla has been surprised. It's taken them so long to understand that this isn't something that's an extra, this is coming. And you know, over the time that we've invested, and we invested when Tesla had reached that first commercial production run rate of tens of thousands of units and for us it was then well, can it make hundreds of thousands can it go beyond that the internal combustion engine manufacturers have been very skeptical right up, right along that period they're not now and you can see it it's not just ours saying they've got the same challenges that tesla have had to face if you google it earlier this year herbert dice from bw said in the next nine years we will produce 26 million electric vehicles that's what we've expected to see. There's been a lot of talk and not a lot of delivery so far from most of the big manufacturers. But he also said it's going to take 33 billion euros in investment to do it from here. And that's what we've said all along. Absolutely, we expect them to catch up, but Tesla has a meaningful head start that is proving longer than we anticipated. And then it's changing the game as it goes through. And these car manufacturers are, will find it very difficult to move away from their legacy assets into a new area where they don't have the skill set around software. And we also, for example, own a company called Aurora, which is a private company set up by the ex-head of Waymo from Google, and their autonomous driving, who are basically looking at being that external that partner to deliver the software element of electric vehicles for the big OEMs. And, and that's part of the, the, the problem that people have got with competing against Tesla. They will have to do it to survive long term, but there's a huge capital challenge. There's a huge intellectual property challenge that they're going to find very difficult to overcome. Now for Tesla, in our investment case, they've done what we wanted them to do. You know, they've learned the lessons from moving from the S and the X to the Model 3. The Model 3 was real challenge. Now look at what they've done in terms of building another plant in Shanghai. They went from breaking ground to delivering vehicles in 10 months. If you look quietly, not reported in the newspapers, but their new Model Y, has been delivered ahead of schedule 
they've taken the lessons from the production hell of model three and remorselessly have applied them to the next production chain. And that's what you want, because in a car manufacturer, it's all about the efficiency of your production line to make margin. I've just seen a related question on Nikolai. Is it a good time to take that Nikolai Motors? Uh, yes, please do. Very briefly, for those who don't know, this is a competitor who are looking at both electric and hydrogen vehicles, early stage, and we have looked at it. The challenge here is, Aside from the comments I made up front about those who, who are in the know that we speak to don't believe that hydrogen is as attractive as electric vehicles are today, given the amount of capital being applied, particularly in battery technology. The challenge here is all of the things that Tesla has struggled with will apply to Nikolai and they're splitting it across two technologies that don't have synergies. So it's almost making it twice as hard and it has been really hard for Tesla. So that, that's sort of the, the way we've been thinking about this in the investment case and saying, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult to scale and create a new business without huge amounts of very patient capital, given the inevitability of the setbacks along the way and the unwillingness of public markets to fund those. How do you scale it till you get to a meaningful competitive advantage for Nikolai? Right. OK, thank you. Now, before turning to this big question about China and uh, US, can we talk about um, SpaceX and flying cars? I love the concept of flying cars. You're invested in both, I think. Yes. So again, I think so sometimes there's a notion that, that what we invest in, it, it sounds, you know, in, in these two instances, pretty glamorous. I mean, who did not look at this rocket land back on a small ship in the ocean and think that is a pretty impressive feat? That is hugely, aside from investment, hugely exciting. But actually at the investment case level, very often underpinning this, when you, when you go away and look at them, they're much more concrete, mundane, you know, longer term, there's huge potential in space, but it's very small, it's hard to assess. However, the potential for launching satellites on a reusable rocket that changes the economics to launch the Starlink system that improves our telecommunications, which we clearly need, that's not so difficult to analyze and think about the competitive advantage. You know, we know how much it costs to put a man, um, a man into a Russian space vehicle to get them up to the International Space Station, and we know what Tesla are charging for it. You know, NASA publishes that. You know, there is quite a lot of information that you can get hold of to look at and say, does this make sense as a business? And we think for SpaceX, absolutely. In SpaceX, you know, there's an extraordinary lady there called Gwyn Shotwell, who delivers Musk's version. And it's worth just taking an aside and talking about Elon Musk, I think, because very often the businesses that we invest in are run by, and, and this is an overused word, but really applies here, extraordinary individuals. To have the mental capacity to create not one, but potentially at least three, and let's say potentially four, so Musk was involved in PayPal, he's created Tesla, he's created SpaceX, we'll see what the boring company does. He's not your average guy and you cannot demand that they will be perfect in their execution. It is worth saying, however, that we do demand a certain level. So where we feel that people overstep, we are prepared to say definitely in private and in public where necessary, that that's not acceptable. But I think you have to accept that to do these extraordinary things takes extraordinary individuals and they may not be terribly comfortable because if they were terribly comfortable, they wouldn't have managed to achieve it. And that that's an important balance that sometimes gets lost and sometimes a demand that companies, particularly in the public space, are absolutely perfect and never make a misstep in their execution. And that's unrealistic. Flying cars? Yeah, please, flying cars, yes. I'm a boy. <laughs> this is essentially a technology that moves helicopters on. So helicopters, vertical takeoff, this is a technology that has the same sort of characteristics in terms of the infrastructure it would require, because it is an electric flight vehicle, for those who don't know, with vertical takeoff, except that the big problem with a helicopter is that you effectively have a single point failure weakness. That doesn't apply to these vehicles. They're a lot nearer than we would think. So they're already, uh, and we own two companies here, Lilium in Germany and JB Aero in the US, both of which are already talking to the flight regulators in their respective countries. This is not something that is a huge number. It's, it's not coming tomorrow, 
but you can see a clear path with vehicles where you can think about the commercial reality of offering transportation systems that replace existing ones today on a, on a cheaper model. And what they do is they have multiple rotating arms that produce the upward lift that can be retilted. So you haven't got a single point failure. The big improvement that made this viable is the improvements around battery density that allows you to get enough power to weight ratio to lift these things off the ground, combined with the amount of investment capital that's going into battery technology to help bring down the cost curve and all of those things. So it's all of these technologies are playing into one another. We think this more broadly ties into transportation is also going to see a huge shift. One, the electrification of the fleet. Two, alongside that, because of the nature of an electric vehicle that is software driven, it plays into the ability to move towards autonomous driving. And so we're thinking about the implications of that. Tesla would be one of the global leaders in that. But then you've also got these the companies like Lilium, like JB, that are taking a completely different approach to it. Because alongside that, you've got the battery technology improvements that we're starting to see. Well, I shall wait for a helicopter Ferrari to come along. Might come back to that in a moment. This very important matter of US-China relationships and the risks that that presents to investment, um, leaving aside the risk of the world, but investment in particular. What's your take on that? So I, I think many will be familiar with the fact that for, for Scottish mortgage, the rise of China, the structural rise of China, has been an important investment theme for well over a decade for us now. And we've said again, you know, the next decade is the same because this is structurally different. You know, this is a vast number of people who are now reaching a level of discretionary spending that brings in a whole range of areas in the economy and is becoming, if it's not already, the world's largest economy. It's clearly the incremental growth area in things like the car market. You know, it really matters that Tesla's present and, and meaningful in terms of its sales in China. And China is clearly moving its, its fleet towards electric. And therefore, the decision is made. If it's not already, again, the largest car market, it's certainly the second largest car market in the world. When that goes electric, you haven't got a choice if you're an automaker of any description. You must have an option that's electric if you want to grow in any meaningful sense in the long term. So the challenge here is that as China grows, it brings into play a challenge to the existing dominant players. And here predominantly, we're obviously talking about the US and that takes time. So we don't think this is a short run thing. We think this is a structural thing that we will have to learn to deal with on all forms, but including as investors long term. And we don't think it's dependent on the current administration in the US. Again, I think in investment terms, as we would always say, it's about picking what you're invested in. There are areas where the competition will really matter and cause some friction. We can come back to those. But for what we invest in, particularly those more driven by software, you're already beginning to see a clear delineation of a sinosphere in US hegemony. So Amazon, as I said, you know, its biggest competitor is Walmart. There's still a lot bigger than it in the US alone. It has plenty of room to grow in its domestic market. It had invested in growing in China. It's now not doing that. And conversely, Alibaba the same. It has plenty of opportunities in its local sphere, but it's not going to pursue its investments in the US. So you're seeing two big companies that, if anything, the most serious competitors who were prepared to commit long-term capital to taking market share have just had a line draw between them. We, a couple of few years back, have been thinking about what happens when those two start to compete. The only area where you're seeing that at the moment is the next big market, which is India. So you are seeing the friction between Flipkart owned by Walmart, Amazon and Alibaba, particularly through its payments platform, Paytm in, in India. You are seeing that separation. Really, that's the only point where they're, they're rubbing up against one another because it's such a large territory and they are competing there. But we don't think that you'll see cross competition in each other's domestic market for, for quite a number of years to come, given the, the situation. There are others, you know, you've seen we own TikTok. You were asking before, what's the next Facebook? I think in recent, certainly 12, 18 months, we've seen the answer to that. You know, the rise of TikTok is extraordinary. It's owned by ByteDance, still a private company created by a team that were at Baidu and couldn't get support for it at Baidu. I don't know how many of your children have become TikTok stars in uh, lockdown. But the platform has got something that's really engaging. Again, this is something that benefits from scale. The better your data set, the more you understand what your, your consumers want to see, the more engaged they are, and it becomes a virtuous circle. 
and that platform is is right around the world in over 150 company countries now and that is just the externally facing non-chinese platform the chinese platform that they have is about twice the size of that Great. Well, thank you all. I'm afraid, Catherine, the TikTok of time has taken us over our allotted time. This has been absolutely terrific. Your new best friend, Suresh Shah, he's very keen on flying cars as well, incidentally. But Suresh rightly describes this as, I'm going to read this out to you, the most informative and actionable presentation of 2020 to date. And I agree with Suresh, as I'm sure would all of our other viewers today. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks to our members for watching. But more importantly, thank you for a really fascinating presentation. And may we ask you to come back, back again soon. Well, certainly, and thank you very much for your time and all the questions. Thank you.